All right, so who am I? Uh, just starting off, my name's Evan. I started at Stride in the spring slash summer of 2018. Originally, my role was fulfilling customer support. Um, I then soon moved, uh, adding on the position of coach and athlete relationship manager, and it kind of spurred by some of the recent global events, we focused a lot on media production, so putting out uh, content in audiovisual form. So I've added that as another hat that I get to wear. Um, in my own personal running career, uh, I'm a 218 marathoner. I ran on the 2020 U.S. Olympic marathon trials uh, here recently at the end of February in the U.S. Um, I like to think that I am not necessarily a triathlete, but I do swimming, biking, and running all as kind of their own individual stuff. So I'm very, very interested uh, in the triathlon side of things, especially since I moved to Boulder and especially uh, since I started working at Stride. It's been a uh, kind of great advancement of one of my interests. So very, very excited to uh, get questions from people later on and present. So talking about Stride, um, I imagine the reason that a lot of people are here is that they have potentially heard of Running With Power. Uh, they might have heard of Stride. They might have a friend or an athlete or uh, somebody they know that has used it. So I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about what it is, how it works, and just how the, our whole platform kind of an ecosystem works. So starting off, Stride is a state-of-the-art wearable technology. You can see it on this uh, Adidas trainer here. It enables coaches to objectively define and evaluate any workout or race, enables runners to target training or racing on any surface, and it makes running individualized and targeted with the ultimate goal of making runners faster. Some details and specifications, just so you know a little bit more about the product. It's compact, it's the size of a US quarter coin. I actually have one here if people can see my video. Um, if not, uh, it's still very, very small. It's light, it weighs eight grams, so you do not notice it uh, on your shoe. Long lasting, 20 plus hours of training on a single charge. It takes about three to four hours to charge. So. Um, if you're feeling really, really good for your running week, you can get uh, you know a, a week of running um, out of it before you have to charge it. But usually for most people, it lasts a lot longer than that. Uh, in terms of connectivity, it can connect and be used with sports watches using an ANT uh, or Bluetooth connection. So both options available. Uh, it can connect to a mobile phone if you want to run with your phone. Uh, and also standalone. This is actually one of the really interesting things, one of the features that I love. Um, specifically, it can record up to 36 hours of internal storage by itself. Um, so that means if you're in the middle of the run and your watch freaks out or you forget your watch or your phone, you can go run with it, come back, just sync out the data afterwards. So um, great little functionality there that I really like. Uh, watch connectivity, a little bit more specific on this. Uh, current watches that are um, you know, kind of industry leaders that are uh, able to connect Apple Watch, Garmin, Polar, and Sunto. Uh, I have little arrows underneath here under the Apple Watch and Garmin. Uh, you can do structured power-based workouts, and this is something that's still um, a relatively new development that we're super excited about in terms of making running with power and training with power easier. Uh, enabling those structured power-based workouts with power alerts, with lap alerts. You can enter all the custom workouts you want. So that's available um, in a pretty new, it's about a month old Garmin workout app. And then the Apple Watch Stride app, um, in my opinion, makes Apple Watch one of the most, most competitive running watches out there. And then Polar and Sunto. Uh, if you are interested in a full compatibility list, that is something we do have at stride.com. Running power and stride. So just to get uh, a, a little bit of a uh, definition and uh, explanation from my side, stride captures the motion of your foot through 3D space uh, using a ton of sensors jam-packed into the small 8-gram package. Uh, it's been lab evaluated via force plate and metabolic measurement systems. Uh, Semi-recent product update of August 2019, uh, we now account for air resistance into the overall power number. So this is something that um, has been worked on uh, and had been worked on a ton uh, leading up until the product release last summer. Super excited to have that feature uh, enabled and added in there. It really brings a completeness to the understanding of your running environment. Uh, and if anybody really is interested, um, uh, the full white papers and methods uh, from all our 
uh, you know, explanation about how Stride works is available at blog.stride.com. And I would be more than glad to talk to anybody uh, afterwards if you have questions specifically um, about running power and, and methods in our white papers. Talking a little bit more branching off of the overall power, uh, critical power is a important concept in the Stride platform. So we define critical power as the threshold at which the dominant type of fatigue your body experience changes. So the type of fatigue when it changes for you, the individual. The duration that we find, it's typically somewhere between 30 to 70 minutes, and it depends again on the individual. We have a couple options. Uh, you can either manually test it. Uh, typically, um, you know, a, a coach might in their training program recommend a certain type of test to establish critical power. One of the uh, about year-old features that we have now is the Stride Auto Calculated Critical Power, which um, is super, super exciting for uh, a coach, an athlete, but also just a regular runner using Stride. Talking a little bit more about Auto CP here, it was tested initially against our elite data. So we have elite athletes that use Stride. Um, it kind of started as a fun project that we, uh, you know, internally were saying, you know what, we have these athletes going to races. It would be helpful if we could somehow give them more of a realistic expectation uh, leading into some of these specific road races and a very small sample. It ended up, uh, the, the modeling and the formulas we were using ended up having their performance where they actually performed on race day within 1%. So for somebody, um, you know, running 300 watts for a 10 mile race, that's within three watts. And so that's, that's, that's amazing. And we thought that, you know, we had to expand upon this. Uh, next step was to test it against um, marathon data, specifically Boston Marathon data, we found compared to manually calculated options, the auto CP had much, much fewer outliers and was uh, a lot more helpful to having people have realistic targets. Then we beta tested it with many, many, many stride users before introduction. And then over time, we've continued to refine it. So I can talk a little bit more about the specific modeling behind our auto calculated critical power. We look for typically three different things, long runs over 60 minutes, medium length, uh, high intensity, medium intensity runs between 10 to 20 minutes, and then short length, very short length, very high intensity uh, efforts between 10 to 30 seconds. So if people are familiar um, with different energy systems and contribution, uh, this is just a neat little graphic to explain the differences of contributions from the different types of activities that we look at, as well as um, having some basis in physiology, physiology here. Running stress score is the thing that I want to talk about next. Uh, and I would also like to say that the, the purpose of this is just to explain some of the uh, features, some of the options you'll find available from Stride and on our platform. Um, and I would be glad to talk in more specificity about anything that people have questions uh, either after or um, you know, at, at the question and answer point. Running stress score is important because it's based off of having a very accurate, uh, you know, day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month critical power. Uh, if people are familiar with a thing like a performance management chart, a training stress score, this is going to be something that is stride specific based off stride data. So we look at your training duration, your power related to the critical power, um, that you have at that moment. It quantifies day-by-day -day running intensity relative to your critical power, which is why the auto-calculated critical power is so much more important. Um, it really gives uh, you know, a championing effect to running stress score. The coefficient K accounts for the fact that there's different intensity levels in running and they spur different physiological adaptations. And RSS, uh, obviously, because it's related to performance management charts, it shares a similar structure to training, trust, training stress score that people might be familiar with, but RSS is specific for the demands of running. On the bottom here, um, here's a quick example of different types of runs, different types of efforts, and the running stress score that they might elicit. The thing that I like to remember is that 100 points is equal to a one-hour race at 100% of your critical power, and you can kind of base things off of that. 
Running stress balance. This is something that people also might be familiar with if you are used to working with a performance management chart. Again, this is for stride specific data. So related specifically to the running, um, you know, running intensities. It's a weighted difference between accumulated long-term running stress and short-term running stress. So we look at the balance between the running stress that you are generating uh, in the app and then online on our power center on our website, which I'll talk a little bit more about uh, in just a little bit. We have different zones. Um, so typically the, the thing that I find the most helpful is not necessarily to aim to have a, a certain type of training zone. That's not really what we do. Um, for this, we find that RSS, running stress score and running stress balance are very good as descriptive tools in your training rather than prescriptive tools. So instead of trying to focus on hitting one specific area, we really, really like seeing people use that to understand their training better. The Stride mobile app, uh, it gives quick summaries and insights it's available on iOS and Android. Uh, we really, really like to have a distinction between the quick things that you can do on the mobile app, as well as the uh, really high, in, high intensity, fine grain analysis that you can do on the desktop. So um, this is a sample screen of what the mobile app looks like. You can do your week, 12 week, one year data for running stress score, distance, duration, elevation. You can view the day by day data as well. And one of the features I think is super cool is this right hand uh, on the right side of this screen, the, the filtering option. You can easily, within 10 seconds, uh, narrow all of your runs. So you can see in the system, I have uh, at least 927 runs in the, in the Stride ecosystem. I can narrow that down in about 10 seconds to you know, five runs that fit the exact criteria. Um, and that's something that we found has been really, really, really useful for people making that really quick analysis. In the mobile app, again, uh, the, the focus is on quickness and getting those insights um, as efficiently as possible. So we offer quick overall summary analytics for each run, as well as quick graphical analytics and quick lap analytics. So again, that mobile side is something that we really, really uh, enjoy having as a, um, you know, very quick tool if you're getting ready for a training session, if you're just finishing up a training session, you can get that information uh, very quickly there. Um, one thing that I'm very excited about is the uh, evolution of our iOS app and Android app. We have a, our iOS developer um, has really, really pushed forward and our Android developer has caught up with that. And so we're really steamrolling through um, adding a bunch of new features and updates to the app as well. And then again, finishing out the app, you can access profile settings, you can directly access support, and you can directly access resources from the app, which I think is incredibly important, just closing the loop, um, making sure if you do need support that you can get all the support that you do need, and making sure that you can quickly, quickly um, get information should you need it. Stride Power Center, this is the desktop version of our platform. Um, it offers a lot more fine grain analysis and it offers different modals and tools that you can see here. So each section is slightly broken up. Um, very, very intuitive, very interactive. This is something that we released a huge refresh and updates at the beginning of the year. The power duration curve, this is another feature in the Stride Power Center. So if people are used to working with power, you might be familiar with the concept of a power duration curve. This is something that we wanted to put as kind of a main focus into our Stride Power Center to help not only coaches and athletes, but a uh, runner who is just beginning running, if they start running with power, they have an immediate understanding of the concept of power and duration and why that's important for performance and for training and for racing. Um, it's something that's very, very cool to use. And I have a couple examples here on how we build on top of a power duration curve. So like I talked about earlier, that auto CP modeled curve, we actually illustrate your exact modeled curve second by second, all the way from one second up until however long you have data. The model uh, for practical purposes goes to 90 minutes uh, right now, um, but we show on the power duration curve all the way up to however long data you have in the system. It's very, very powerful to be able to understand that specifically this example I highlighted, uh, at 44 seconds, you can click and pin a number 
you can see that I have done 391 watts for 44 seconds, but I know that I can go harder than that. The modeled ability shows that that is what the auto CP modeling is showing what my ability actually is. So this is an incredibly useful tool for finding gaps in your power duration curve, knowing exactly how fast you should run a time trial and just having a better sense of your fitness over different areas without having to necessarily do an all out test, have to recover from that. This is a really, really cool interactive tool that we have. And then the other thing here is comparison. So the comparison that I have is a August 1st through October 1st of two different years, so 2018 and 2019. And we can see how my training has actually varied over time. So if we look at the, the blue line here, we can see that I was doing higher intensity for a shorter amount of time, but between one and five minutes, actually the year after that, I had a better one to five minute power and then we see how these things kind of step and trade off over time. So something that offers a lot of really cool analytics into your own uh, training. You can view, view this day by day. You can view this season by season. You can mark whatever type of comparison you want to do and compare your power duration curves over time. Talking a little bit more about stride metrics specifically, the things that we offer right now in our power center are power, obviously, air power, which is shown as a percentage, again, uh, noting that we released the most updated stride device um, in August of 2019. Air power shows as a percentage of your overall power that is contributed from having to overcome air resistance. We offer pace. Again, like I mentioned, stride is a standalone unit, so you do not actually have to pair it with a GPS watch to get pace um, from, you know, from, from your GPS watch while you're running. People find uh, stride pace and distance very, very reliable, especially um, if you're running in a major city marathon. Uh, you know, here in the US, there are marathons like New York and Chicago that go in between tall buildings and people default to stride pace automatically for that. Um, we do find that uh, stride is a lot more uh, precise and accurate uh, over time compared to GPS as well. Elevation, um, this is something that will be displayed if you're using a watch, but again, since stride is standalone, it'll also track your elevation that you're at, as well as elevation gain. Uh, if you have a, or it, it also shows uh, cadence because it's based from the foot. If you use a watch that records heart rate uh, or you have a phone, um, that an app that'll record heart rate as well, depending on whatever heart rate source that you collect, uh, Stride will show that as well. Um, it's not something that uh, we focus on, but we absolutely will show that uh, if you use that in your training. Form power is an interesting metric. This is something that I would simply describe as the power that is um, not being used to move forward. So this is kind of a, a, a breakdown of your overall power. Um, ground contact time, we display that in milliseconds. Leg spring stiffness is a metric to show how efficiently your leg is recycling energy over time. Vertical oscillation is the amount that the center of your mass is oscillating uh, on an average. Again, you can look second by second. You can view uh, you know, whole repeats. You can view whole race. You can see a trend. Um, vertical oscillation, very, very useful as well. Um, when you click every single metric on, that graph at the bottom of the screen uh, shows what it looks like. So it makes a pretty cool, fun looking picture, but you can definitely have the ability to toggle on as many as you want, as few as you want, and compare to your heart's desire for that. I want to talk a little bit uh, about air power really quickly. This is, again, that, that newest sort of metric that we introduced. Uh, for the specific development of the product. It was tested in controlled settings in multiple wind tunnels around the world. Um, so not just here in the US, but multiple wind tunnels around the world. We tested it also outdoors in various running conditions. So it's very important to uh, get validity inside a lab, uh, comparing different lab measures that you know, but also show repeatability and reliability outdoors. So we tested outdoors in various running conditions. We're very lucky uh, here in Colorado, uh, specifically in Boulder, where we're at, we sit at the foothills. Um, and so we get a lot of wind, a lot of year round. We also tested indoors on the treadmill to make sure uh, that it can account for the fact that you do not have to overcome air resistance on the treadmill. Um, and we handle crosswinds and tailwinds winds and it maintains accuracy in low and high altitudes, low and high temperatures, low and high humidity, low and high pressure zones. So very robust feature. Um, 
that is definitely something if people are interested in reading more about air power, the white paper that we released um, along with the introduction of the new foot pod, again, in August of 2019, that is a fascinating read just to look through all the methods and data collection there. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about activity analysis just so people are a little bit familiar with how our platform works. This is actually a uh, workout I did earlier this morning for everybody watching. So I wanted to get a uh, cool uh, workout. This was uh, 14 times one minute hard, one minute easy. And I'll talk a little bit more specifically about some examples that I found really interesting that relate to some of the stuff I've been talking about. So in depth on hills, we can see this gradient here in the background. This re represents the elevation. We can see that during this first repeat, so this is repeat number 10, I had to overcome uh, a change in elevation. And then this second repeat was a lot more flat. So I broke it down in a table here at the very bottom here. We can see that uh, my power was 353 watts for each minute repeat. My pace varied incredibly, more than 30 seconds a kilometer. My cadence was almost identical. Ground contact time as I went up a hill was about, uh, or was 208 milliseconds versus 191 milliseconds. I had 9.1 meters of elevation gain in that first repeat and only 1.5 meters in that second repeat. Vertical oscillation was lower as I was going up a hill, which makes sense. Air power was um, about the same. So this is just a quick example of how you can parse information uh, on our platform. If you use other platforms, um, you can absolutely do that as well. But this is a really quick snapshot of how Stride shows you a little bit more insight into your activity. And I also have an example here for repeat two versus repeat seven. Uh, repeat two, I was running into a headwind, but downhill. Uh, repeat seven, I was running up a hill and I did not have uh, as much of a headwind. So the air power differed a couple percent there. We can see the difference in the metrics here, but again, very, very cool. Um, to be able to read a little bit more into uh, the, the, the running that we have and the metrics that we have just based on Power Center. So you can zoom in second by second, view all the hardcore analytics you want, or you can get a very good overall snapshot of the workout. Racing with Stride, this was a quick practical example I wanted to give about using Stride during a race as well. So this uh, athlete is a female athlete. It's the same athlete in both cases. Uh, the weight uh, for this athlete on their stride is 44.5 kilograms. They have an auto-calculated critical power of 216 watts, which is 4.85 watts per kilogram for this athlete. Uh, they had a half marathon PR in this first use case of 118.50 heading into the goal race. This was the Houston half marathon here in the U.S. Uh, just in January. Based on all their stride workouts, all their stride data, um, I had talked to this athlete and I believe that 208 to 212 watts was achievable. The result, 210 watts, a new PR of 115.28 for half marathon. And then in the second case, uh, this was the same female athlete running at the U.S. Olympic Marathon Trials just at, here at the end of February in the U.S. Uh, they previously had a marathon personal best of 244.52. Uh, the Atlanta, Georgia course was very hilly, very windy. Um, the predicted and uh, estimated power range to stick to was between 197 and 201 watts. The athlete ran 200 watts, dead on, 246.08, um, ended up passing 80 people in the last half of the race. So uh, pacing very, very consistently, sticking dead on that target, um, had, had a great day. So racing with stride is just as valuable as training with it. You glean a lot of information during training, but racing is where you can really put all of that data to good use and you can absolutely achieve personal bests in a very intelligent and calculated way. Talking about training platform integration, this is the last part of Power Center. So we import from, like, like I mentioned, uh, different, different uh, devices. So whether you use Garmin, Polar, Sunto, we have a dedicated Apple Watch app. We export to uh, different platforms like Training Peaks. We use WKO, uh, Final Surge. We work on Zwift, uh, Polar, Today's Plan, as well as many, many, many others. Um, basically, if you are currently using a training platform that takes a FIT file or a TCX file, um, the Stride data just gets tagged along uh, with that, just depending on what watch you use. So that's training platform integration, which I think is an incredibly important thing for uh, coaches and athletes to know you don't want to all of a sudden get switched out of um, your normal routine. So this is something that we like to work with a lot of different training platforms. 
and talking a little bit uh, about ordering fulfilling stride specifically to Australia. Um, pricing right now is 359 Australian dollars. Shipping and GST is included. Uh, we have a one-year warranty and we have a great support team that I'm very, very proud and honored to be part of myself. We currently ship from our Boulder, Colorado headquarters via DHL um, for uh, reliability in terms of transit and then also um, for very, very quick shipping, as quick of shipping as we can get from the US to Australia right now. Uh, next stage is something I'm very, very excited about is a total reworking of our coaching platform. Uh, our goal is to connect athletes that are using Stride to run with power and coaches that are coaching with power. And we want to build a platform for coaches and athletes to interact, uh, as well as produce a stockpile of coaches education and resources. So if you are adding in power uh, to your coaching, we want to give you as much resources as possible to uh, champion your athletes as well as your knowledge of the sport. Some links to have, um, I will be sure to coordinate afterwards and make sure that this gets sent out if anybody is interested. Uh, stride.com obviously, coach at stride.com is the dedicated email um, that I am responsible for, for interacting with all coaches. Support at Stride will go to our talented support staff if there are any issues. Again, you can access support directly in the app. Um, I would appreciate it if people follow us on Instagram at Stride Running, Twitter at Stride Running. We have a great YouTube channel that I've been really excited to produce a lot of content at recently. We also have a great podcast, which can be found at stride.com slash podcast. You can hear from great coaches like Jim Vance, who has a very early um, appearance on our podcast. And so a lot of information on all those various uh, platforms there, but definitely good links to have. And that wraps it up for my presentation. So I hope I did not bore anybody getting into the details. I would be glad to answer questions after Jim gets to give a great presentation and talk more about power coaching. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks, Evan. That was great. Evan, uh, quite honestly, I, I feel, uh, I feel a little ignorant to not know what a great runner you are, dude. Like, I'm not, <laughs> I know you a lot. I know you went to the trials. Well done. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was fun. It was a good experience well, for sure. Well, so, uh, why don't before you get any sort of bias from my my presentation, why don't you just share with us one thing that you're like, if you if you had to sell stride or run with power in general, but yeah, so coach, what's the one thing you would say? This is this is reason enough. There's tons. Yeah, but. yeah for sure. Um, I, I, the, the one thing that I could absolutely think of, uh, and, and now that I have a little bit of time to pause and think, there's like five or 10 reasons coming into my head, right? But uh, the one thing I could probably say is that for coaches and athletes, the job of trying to improve performance is already hard enough. There's so many things that get tossed around, so many conventions that people go to, so many conversations that people have, now so many webinars people attend. With Stride, in my own personal training and my own, uh, you know, I, I coach a few people on the side as well that use Stride specifically, taking the guesswork out of training and racing is I think one of the, the greatest things that can possibly be done, just making a coach's and athlete's life and job easier and just help them execute, uh, plan, execute, and then reflect on that goal and that, you know, that training session, that race. That's one thing I think, um, if I just sell any reason about Stride, is it just takes the guesswork out of things and the concept of using power as, um, you know, it, as I'm sure you're going to go into great detail. Uh, it's just a, a great way to think about things. And I, I just find that keeping things as simple as possible and not complicating things um, is, is probably my first reason. Sure. No, it's great. I, I don't disagree. I think... Uh... It's and and so for everyone here, I'll, I'll, I'm I'm Jim Vance, and so I'll I'll kind of speak more on the practicality of what we're doing, and a lot of things that Evan kind of just talked about in terms of the things you can do. You know, you can dial into numbers, you can you can do what you want in a lot of ways. Uh, if you're if you're a real tech, you know, numbers type of person, if you're a coach who's like, you know, I'm just looking for ways to coach my athletes better. That's really what I'm going to talk about in in the practicality of things so 
I'll go ahead and share my screen here and kind of go, go with this. So, and I realize we probably have some athletes on here, so uh, maybe, uh, you know, maybe you're not a coach, that's okay, but uh, you know, maybe you coach yourself and that's, that's reason enough to kind of watch this and, and, and see what we're talking about. To give you guys a little background on me, um, I run a junior program in San Diego called Formula Endurance, um, but I'm an author. Uh, I, my first book I ever did was, uh, was with Joe Frio. We did triathlon science. I co-edited that with him, a number of contributors. Then triathlon 2.0 was kind of my first foray into my own, uh, work. I did that book with human kinetics as the publisher. Um, and it was, uh, it was pretty successful. It's about how to coach yourself using a power meter on your bike and a GPS on your watch and, uh, and heart rate strap. And when I wrote that, the book took four years to write, um, power, run power didn't exist. <laughs> so, um, that, that kind of was, uh, uh, a little behind, you know, right at the end of, of that part where run power kind of came in. And then, uh, I did write run with power. It was the first book on power meters for running. Um, it's, uh, you know, a lot of it is still theoretical, um, in what I talked about, but I think y you'll walk away with an understanding of what's really possible. Um, I give some examples. I created some metrics. Some have been adopted really well. Some, some maybe haven't, and that's okay. Um, you know, at the time, literally, uh, I can tell you, it's kind of funny. I, I think uh, I signed the contract to write the book in in May of 2015, and they wanted the book in November or December of 2015, and I did not get my first power meter, which was actually from Stride until about uh, October of 2015. So literally, I was like, guys, I can't write a book in two months on, on a subject I don't really know anything about. So, uh, and that was back when Stride was simply just a chest strap. So uh, a lot of things I did on there was, was, was based on the Stride power meter when it was a chest strap. So uh, obviously things have improved a lot. Uh, one of the things I kind of alluded to in the book that I said, hey, we're gonna be able to do this down the road is things like measuring the bioelasticity of the muscle in the leg and what stride later created is now called leg spring stiffness. So it's been cool to see some of that. Um, I'm probably also well known as uh, the coach of uh, US triathlete uh, and Olympian Ben Canute. Um, ben, ben, I've known Ben many, many years since he was just a teenager, young teen uh, on the US junior circuit. Uh, got to know his family real well. His coach was actually an athlete I was coaching, um, and it was a business partner of mine. And so I always kind of had a seat at the table as a data guy to help him. And then after the 2016 uh, Rio Games, he wasn't he wasn't really satisfied with how that race went, and so he came to me and said, "Hey, I think think about making a change and coming to you. Uh, what do you think?" And you know, I was like, one of the first things I told him was. Uh, if you come to me, yeah, great, but we got to commit to technology. We got to, we got to learn. We got to, we got to use this. If we're going to get ahead, technology is going to be our tool uh, to, you know, to basically get our advantage against uh, your competitors to train better. And, you know, I think if you, if any of you follow uh, Ben's career, you'll notice that basically in, from 2017 post Olympics, uh, his career has been incredibly consistent and it's just taken a new level. And Stride is absolutely one of those reasons. Uh, we used it, um, we continue to use it. Um, it's, it's just the, in our approach to training that, that things like uh, Stride has provided. But, you know, you, I mean, you can, there are other, other uh, companies out there that you're free to use. Uh, so, you know, I'm not, I'm certainly not tied to Stride by any sort of, uh, uh, you know, committed deal or anything like that. I'm, I'm simply telling you what we've used. So uh, now uh, I work for a company called Today's Plan, which is an Australian-based company, ironically, and uh, does a lot of uh, analytics. Um, and I know a lot of you probably use uh, Training Peaks and things, which is great. Um, you know, you're free to use platforms of your choice. Uh, obviously, Stride has a has a, a very improving platform as well. So uh, you know, don't don't take this as an endorsement of of well, there's only you have to use this or that. So. So, you know, the first thing I want to say is run power. Uh, keep it simple. You know, yes, 
Evan just threw a lot at you and there's a lot you can do. I think sometimes coaches and athletes, they get so overwhelmed by all the potential options there are. It's like grow into it. You know, you didn't learn the English language by, you know, from a fire hose and learning every word. It's like you learned a little bit at a time. So take, take run power the same way, you know, start small, move through it, see, see how you're doing, see, you know, see what you learn as you go through this process, because I think that's, that's really important. I'm going to be the first to tell you, I don't have all the answers. I really don't. Um, it's funny. I can say I literally wrote the book on power and it still took me two years after I wrote that book before I really started to prescribe workouts according to run power. Um, so that, that tells you like, even I was like, okay, I wrote this. This is what I think. This is what I kind of believe, but do I really believe it? Let me go and test. Let me go and try. Let me go and learn. So don't feel like if you got this, like suddenly you got to go and it's a full 100% commitment. It's like, you know, you're going to have a lot of questions. And like I say, I still have questions. So, you know, the human body is a very complex machine, uh, physiologically and biomechanically. So don't, don't think you have to be an expert. And, and as long as you kind of take that mentality and understanding of that, you know, you don't have all the answers, I think you're going to, and you're open to learning, I think you're going to find that you're probably pretty successful. And I'll, and I'll share some of that. The next thing I would tell you, just collect data. Just start collecting it. Go look at, you know, it, maybe this is just yourself. Put it on your shoe, uh, you know, if you're using Stride, and go run. And just start looking and seeing, you know. It was interesting what uh, what uh, Evan showed there and his, just in his workout today. You know, that would, uh, that was some pretty good info about, okay, yeah, this this interval wasn't as fast, but the watts were the same. And then you combine that with your own experience. Okay, well, I, I know I was going about the same intensity level, even though the pace wasn't there. Okay, well, you know, maybe that gives you some 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 sense of, hey, this has credibility and and is is accurately reflecting what I believe to be true. Um, so. So collect data, collect data from multitudes of different races, Ironman races, 70.3 races, sprint tries, draft legal uh, races, non-draft, Olympic distance, uh, Xterra, whatever, whatever it is you're doing, or whatever types of athletes you're coaching, if it's, if it's in the triathlon space, just heck, if you're just coaching running, or runners or even just going out on runs, go collect that data, go back and look. That's really the key. Um, look at training. Okay. Look at, look at the data from training and especially from races though, because then you have the opportunity to say, okay, this was, the, this was the race. Here were the race demands. Now let's look back and see what did our training really do to represent that? We thought it did. Did it really from a run power standpoint? Because remember run power is simply just a work rate, how you move through space. That's it. So if, if you're not, not really representing the work rate that's required uh, based on the demands of competition, then you're probably going to want to reassess what you're doing. And that's really how you can refine. And this is a long process. It's probably an annual process. Go through and look and, and see, uh, you know, okay, here's what we thought. Here's what we trained. Here's the numbers the athlete was hitting in training. And then we got to the race and they hit those numbers or they didn't. Um, you know, Evan gave some great examples with uh, a, a half marathon female also performing really well at the marathon. Uh, it's a little bit easier in running because you know the the variables certainly are not are not as multiple. Uh, in triathlon, we have a tremendous number of variables, so it's it's not necessarily a, well, a a a or b. It's it's understanding all those variables and how things work. You know, you got to see what kind of correlates. So when I talk about taking that race data and that training data, let me give you a perfect example. Um, last year, I coached four athletes um, in that were Ironman triathletes. Uh, three of them made Kona. So I'd say that's a pretty pretty good uh, pretty good uh, ratio. And one of them just missed it. So looking at that, 
I started looking at, okay, I really need to, to help these athletes in their, in their rowing, especially Ironman run pacing. And if any of you have ever followed me, I do a lot of uh, run pacing things with uh, in Kona measuring uh, first mile for the longest time I was doing that. Um, you know, what I actually found was I could take an athlete's easy run watts and somewhere approximately 5% uh, higher than those easy run watts five, maybe, you know, and you can go plus or minus probably 2%, maybe three. This is for you to go and correlate and find, uh, those athletes, that was pretty much what they were running off the bike in an Ironman plus or minus, you know, five, 5% plus or minus, you know, two to 3%. Um, and some of that's, well, you might say, well, that's a pretty big plus or minus. Well, got to realize there's a lot of things involved. Um, you know, of course, the conditions that they're running in, uh, how hard the bike was, how well did that athlete really follow their nutrition plan, uh, those types of things. So how well did they actually pace the bike and follow the pacing plan? So, but it makes sense because I think we all know if you go for an easy run, you know, uh, that pace probably isn't that far off what your Ironman run, run pace is. So for an athlete, so when you start looking at those and you start, you start lining it up, you're like, okay, there should be some correlation, but what is that correlation? And I think so many athletes and coaches look at pace as the, as the guiding number, which is a result and power is, is, is reflective of the process. Um, so understanding how the athlete is moving through space, that's, that's their process. So the ability to kind of give yourself a guideline and then, and then strategically plan based on, based on that. That's also going to help, help you coach athletes better, or even for yourself. We, we've all worked with an athlete who's like, man, I want to come off the bike and I want to run six minute mile pace or, you know, four minute case. And you're like, uh, yeah, that's not really what you're capable of, but okay. Um, we've all been there. So those types of things, uh, it, it helps kind of give the athlete a new reflection. And it's objective. One of the reasons I wrote Triathlon 2.0 was I had so many athletes that came to me that said, I want to qualify for Kona. And, and I didn't have a, you know, I didn't want to have a bedside manner that was like, you have no chance. I wanted to instead say, well, here's all the research I've done about what it takes to qualify for Kona. And here's where you are. And then it wasn't me telling them that they weren't capable. It was just me being reflective of what's, what's really required. Um, and therefore they really started to buy into the plan to understand, Hey, if I actually hit these numbers, then I can actually achieve this. And that kind of goes to what Evan was talking about, which to me is the number one key in any athlete I work with. I want to give an athlete extreme confidence. Um, to me, that's the best thing I can do for them. So what do I do? Well, I, I review workout targets. Are we above or under what those race demands are? Um, if we're, you know, if we're using the run power as, as the target, well, and the athlete hits it, that's the great thing. Now they're suddenly, they, they feel confident about a workout. They're not judging their workouts based on pace. And that brings me to some of the stories here with Canute that I'll, that I'll share. Um, thankfully, Ben was a, Ben's been a blessing to coach. He's, he's very coachable. Uh, he's very committed to the plan that we create. Um, I'll give you an example of one of the very first times I really truly saw the value of running power and it's totally related to what Evan said and what I just shared. Uh, we were in a training camp here in San Diego where I'm based and we were preparing for the 2017, uh, 70.3 worlds and Ben, uh, Ben was tired and I saw it, but I knew that we had to get this tempo work in. I'm like, man, we got to get this tempo work in. This hard tempo effort here has to be done. And I want to say it was, it was going to be like three times, uh, I want to say something like three times 20 minutes, uh, basically at about 70.3 goal pace off the bike. And what I realized, though, was that he, he wanted to try to run about five, you know, 530, five, sub 530 mile pace. So... I was like, man, I, I don't know if he can do that today. And so I was like, I wanted to just kind of switch and take his mind off that because if he tried that, 
And let's say he did the first interval at that goal pace, and then he dug himself in a hole so deep that intervals two and three were worthless or potentially injured him, then we've messed up. But if I could get him to, to, to change what he actually, what his kind of baseline was in terms of how he judged success and failure, then, then maybe I had a chance for him to walk away, still get the stimulus we want and walk away and feel confident that he accomplished it. So I said, look, um, here's what you've run off the bike in your previous two 70.3s that he had done that year, which was Puerto Rico, uh, where you were in 119 or 120 and then 117 at uh, St. George. And I said, okay, I'm going to have you just run those same Watts for, for these, this and I don't care what pace is just stay on the watts you don't like the pace you need to figure out how to make it a little bit faster you're a little tired so it might not translate and he said okay and he walked away from that workout and he hit the watts and all three and the paces were pace was probably about 15 seconds off what what we thought goal pace would be um but he walked away and said nailed that workout did exactly what you said hit it hard hit it great and I was like that's perfect that's what I want. I want my athlete walking away feeling successful. And, and I, it, it was a gamble at the time. I, I felt like, well, this is reflective of what he's done off the bike in these, these two races, and it should be reflective of what we're trying to prepare for. And then obviously I think we know kind of what happened in 2017. He came off the bike and, and ended up running 116 uh, at, at, that, uh, at Chattanooga and uh, finished second. Uh, in a big breakthrough race. And I, I, I always, I still to this day remember listening to the commentators on the, on the race call say, well, he's looking at his watch because he, he's worried about his pace. He's running slow. He knows these great runners are coming uh, and they're not worried about him. He'll fade. And then at 9K, the race changed. 9K, those guys stopped gaining on him. And uh, the only person that continued to really gain on him was Javier Gomez. Um, and that was... You know, that was great to see. And what those what those uh, commentators didn't know is Ben was actually looking at his watch and uh, judging run watts because I told him his goal was don't do not go over 340 watts, no matter what. Uphill, downhill and Chattanooga was an extremely hilly course. And we had tested here in my neighborhood on a on a one mile loop that we created. And and we said, OK, we're going to run at these watts. Let's let's see what this pace gives us. And he saw it and. New, and I think it equated to like a 115 pace coming off a bike workout immediately following or pre previously that that uh, was very representative of 70.3 intensity and race race demands and and he walked away from that saying okay I can get it what do you think I said yeah I think you can run between 114 and 116 and he ran 116 on an extremely hard course and uh, you know uh, the, the our ability to see that was definitely from uh, from the power data uh, and uh, confirming that with pace uh, with everything and gave him a number that we felt comfortable saying, just stay under this number and you'll run really fast. Um, hill sprints, interval goals. Uh, we work a lot with Bobby McGee. Uh, Bobby McGee is, uh, he coached uh, the 2016, or 26, sorry, 1996 um, uh, Olympic marathon champion, Josiah Tagwani from South Africa. Bobby is a South African himself lives in uh, Boulder area. He is, uh, he also helped coach Gwen. He's helped coach Katie Zafaris. I want to say Gwen, Gwen Jorgensen. Um, he works with us um, and he and I have created a number of running protocols and progressions and done a lot with run data. Um, so hill sprints, like, so when we're really trying to do max power for, for Ben on some of his hill sprints, that's one of the things we do. We say, okay, the number's got to hit this. And if he's not hitting that by the second interval, then he's too fatigued and we shut it down. Because on a hill sprint, how do you know? You don't really know, but we use run power to kind of tell us, okay, if he hits this number, you know, at least this number, then, then he's probably good enough for the workout. Um, it generally takes a, an interval too. Um, I talked about 2017 Worlds, so uh, I don't want to go too too far into that. 2018 Worlds, uh, same thing, you know, he. One year later, we felt more confident. Um, ben was able to uh, to actually raise his threshold, that uh, value that we kept him under, um, which it went from 340 the year before to about 350 the next year. Um, and he ended up running 112 and change at the 2018 Worlds. So 
uh, you think about it, I think, I think if, if we correlate and looked at Ben's run, run time progression off the bike in 70.3, his first, he went 120, he went 117 at St. George, he went 116 at, uh, at 70.3 Worlds 2017. Next, next he went 114 at Texas 70.3, then he went 112. So we cut off eight minutes in a year's time. Uh, based on the way we structured his training and and uh, were able to do this, so that was that was pretty good. Um, you know, I, I don't see too many progressions like that as a whole. Uh, I think I think here's the thing too. I'm a big believer in a two day rule or a 48 hour rule, uh, however you want to look at it or call it. Um, something Ben and I kind of created, and we said as long as we can, we don't need more than two days of recovery or 48 hours. Uh, if we, if we take that, that third day should be a home run workout. If it's not, then we're working too hard. We're digging too deep. We need to back off. And that allows us to keep the density of his work high, but not necessarily the total load, um, in, in the sessions. And I think that's been one of the reasons why you've seen him show such versatility from, from super sprint with mixed relay. Uh, to non-draft Olympic distance type things to 70.3 uh, progression. So, so why don't I why don't I just share here? This this is an example, um, and here I am on today's plan with this. And so this is uh, this was Ben's uh, Edmonton WTS run power file. Uh, this was last July. Ben finished uh, seventh in that race, um, which was a big breakthrough race for him. Very hard bike um in the way things went uh, hard hard course and hard run course actually and you can see in here so we use stride rss and and actually that says run t score i need to switch that so uh we'll, so this way because we we like to use our uh, stride rss on this platform we're able to choose that um and then here i'm looking at you know different things stride length and all this came from the stride as you can see the unit head unit was stride so his weight, um, you know, form power, leg spring stiffness, leg spring stiffness relative to his, his uh, body mass. Um, so power pace ratio, which is like your, uh, your running effectiveness. Um, so, so we were able to, I share this workout because this workout really did a lot for us in terms of saying, okay, when he's really running well, this is, this is what it should look like. So you can see a big uphill and a downhill it was three laps so so what we do is we we actually looked at this and said you know the value is actually about 375 watts that he averaged for that race um, and that suddenly became our target number so when we are specifically targeting for Ben uh, efforts designed to help him in a in an ITU uh, sprint distance race his intervals need to be around 375 watts and if we do that, then, then, we're, then we're probably getting close to actually representing what needs to happen. Um, those were the highest watts he ever produced in, in a, in a 70.3, or sorry, in an ITU uh, sprint off the bike. And no surprise, it was his best run. You can see he really holds his pace really well uh, um, for, the, for the duration of the run there. Um, even his power isn't bad. He's leveraging the downhill, still, still maintaining. Uh, and this is Kate, uh, Lake Spring stiffness, actually. So all good. And uh, yeah, so these, these are just some of the ways we use it. Uh, I think there's there's certainly other ways other coaches are using it. Um, Evan shared some of the some of the things that you can do, but I'm more of a practical guy. Let's let's collect some data. Let's look at it, and then let's use that data to to create targets and and guidelines for the, for that athlete specifically. So. So with that, uh, I think I've gone over a little bit here. So sorry, Rob, uh, but I know you talked about maybe using uh, the last few minutes for, for questions. So why don't I, why don't I go ahead and uh, do you want me to read the questions, Rob, or you want to take over? Tell me, tell me kind of what you want to do. Um, yeah, uh, I'd probably just uh, in, invite people to start asking questions that they want in the uh group chat for for everybody to uh everybody to see 
Um, so if you've got a question, uh, type it out now and, and we'll, we'll see how we go. Um, so uh, I think Andre, you've got a, you've got a question you'd like to ask. Um, but just before that, we've got one from Caleb who's saying, how are you testing for critical power? Um, presume there is a, a protocol in the test. That's a great question. Um, you know, I'll be honest. I don't really test that much anymore. Um, you know, I, uh, yes. Uh, I mean, I, I think we're kind of the point where with my athletes, I kind of know what their threshold power is. I mean, <laughs> you know, based on certain durations they can put out. Um, that was one of the things I really liked about what Evan showed there was an ability to not have to test and recover from that test. Because if you're really talking about a threshold test, I mean, you're, you're probably talking 30 minutes of effort. I mean, you could, you could there's a high injury risk with that. Um, in Run With Power, I talked about a, a, a test that I uh, created, I think well, it was a 3-9 test, which I kind of got from Stride. Those guys at Stride, they were, they were very helpful with information back then. And, and they've even created some others. But, you know, I, I think that's one of the features that they have is where you probably you don't need to test as much. I mean, just model it. I mean, it, it, I, I, I also think that if, if, you're, if you're seeing continuous improvements in athletes, that's more important than any sort of critical power test. Because um, uh, I go back to it, I believe in confidence. Um, I can write the perfect training plan for an athlete and it doesn't matter if the athlete is on the start line and isn't excited to race, believing in themselves, and and ready to rock. And uh, it, it's they'll never meet or reach their potential. So I believe more. My whole focus is more on: Are you improving? And I look for opportunities to show them that they're improving. And if I can do that, we're good. Because you will, especially as a triathlete, you will never ever be on the start line without without a weakness you just won't. Uh, the question is, will, will you, you know, will you care about your weaknesses or will you just be like, they don't matter. I can overcome them. And that's, that I think has been the biggest thing with canoe is, and why you've seen so much consistency with him. Um, I pulled him back and I said, you know, I, I, I distinctly remember asking him, okay, in 2016, uh, how many races did you feel good at? He said two. I said, dude, dude, you do this for a living. You're an Olympian. Stop doing your competitors a favor. Stop beating yourself into the ground. Like, dude, you know, make, make your competitors take risk. So reduce risk in training. Look for ways to reduce risk in training. And that's what run power can do, uh, especially because running is probably the, the most risky thing we do outside of a crash on a bicycle, you know, potentially. So so I'm not a I'm I'm just not a big guy on testing for critical power uh, and threat or thresholds and this and that. I'm more like, okay, I let I let systems tell me that stuff's gone up. You know, uh, uh, nowadays I think that's you know today's plan has that. I know Training Peaks has that. Stride has that. Let them do that and and just focus on getting your athletes prepared, uh, especially mentally for the start line. So. From from Stride's point of view, uh, Evan, I, I think we've had a a very good um, coach's perspective there. Um, from from Stride's point of view, uh, you, you talked about uh, auto critical power in the platform, um, which I, I'm guessing will take a, a few runs for for the platform to to start dialing in. Um, for people just starting out. And a brand new to it, um, Jim alluded to a three nine test. There is, is there a particular thing that Stride would, or a particular protocol that, that Stride would recommend for people just starting out? Yeah, so um, I definitely echo uh, Jim Jim's point there. But in terms of functionality, right now there is indeed a three minute, uh, nine minute test, as well as a uh, 1200 and 2400 test with uh, ample bouts of recovery in between. So they're two separate tests. Um, the other two methods are entering a recent 5K time and entering a recent 10K time. Uh, so obviously estimating just off of one point or estimating off two points 
um, does not give you as much information as looking at your ability to sustain power across many, 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 many points. So that's the um, best thing that we've found uh, specifically about auto CP is it considers the individual. Um, so if an individual is more predisposed to, um, you know, having a very, very high output for, you know, up to 30 seconds, but they have a huge drop off, um, they're obviously going to have a different critical power uh, compared to an athlete uh, that, you know, maybe is able to sustain those submax efforts, those very, very, um, you know, right above threshold efforts for a different amount of time. So in terms of functionality, yeah, uh, you still can enter those in the stride system. We don't want to take away that functionality, but we absolutely uh, believe the auto critical power, um, you know, for multiple reasons, uh, the, the fact that it, in all our testing leads to fewer outliers. And specifically, if we go to a race like the Boston Marathon, the New York City Marathon, people are coming up to us just asking for kind of last minute race suggestions. Um, we found that we were much, much more confident giving them something that they're actually able to perform to rather than having the tail ends of outperforming or underperforming the auto CP really smushes stuff together. So um, auto CP, we, we find that it has been very good. And like I mentioned, we've refined it since its introduction, we keep adding to it. Brilliant. Um, so I've got a question from uh, Andre, who's asking uh, what would be, what is the most difference between power efficiency and pace power ratio? Uh, and Andre uses today's plan and running effectiveness. Nice softball question. I'll just throw that across to you guys. Yeah, um, I can comment, I guess, from, from my side really quick here. So I see the link here uh, from the blog.stride.com. Um, Specifically on Stride right now, we do not display um, running effectiveness. And this is, um, it, it is definitely a metric we're aware of. So for people that don't know, running effectiveness is your meters per second over your watts per kilogram. Um, specifically for power of efficiency. Um, I'm not necessarily uh, as familiar with that exa exact term there. Uh, the reason we don't display running effectiveness right now is because if we want to display something, we have to be 100% certain the pace source is from stride or else the meters per second um, isn't as reliable as the watts per kilogram because obviously if you're recording with stride, the watts per kilo is going to come from stride. The pace, uh, unless we're guaranteed to have it coming from stride. We don't want to show something we believe is inaccurate um, and is not the right representation of the actual data being collected. Um, but I, I definitely say, uh, Jim, you could probably definitely answer more um, about that site if you have that in today's plan. Well, uh, on today's plan, power efficiency uh, looks at, uh, you know, your adjusted power divided by your average heart rate. So it takes heart rate into account. And I'm not a big heart rate guy, so uh, I don't I don't use it. Um, so you know that's that's one thing. Um, and then pace power ratio is, is very similar um, in, in terms of uh, our RE uh, running effectiveness. So there, uh, I want to say minimal differences. Mostly, they might even be exactly the same. I can, honestly, it's been so long. I don't. Here's and here's the difference too. I think I think running effectiveness is go back to it is 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 a great tool, and that power pace ratio is a great tool for an athlete who is just a run, because there's you have eliminated all the variables of a swim, a bike, you know. I mean, we all know doing a marathon and doing a marathon or a half marathon uh, standalone. Chances are you're starting early in the morning when it's cold cooler temps and you know you've gotten a chance to warm up and everything's great start you know you do it in a triathlon and you're starting in a hotter time of the day with a ton of other things that have happened before so it, it, to use to use it as a as a guideline of what you can do off the bike is is probably not very realistic um there's just too many variables that you're that you're just assuming have no bearing and and we all know that's not the case so uh, I think for, for straight up runners, it's, it's a great metric. Those are great metrics. For, for triathlon, if you're actually looking to, to do things, uh, plan performance, it's not very good. Now, 
looking at improvements of that of those of those metrics over time you're you know especially maybe like in long runs things like that you're looking for those types of efficiency gains then yes then then it's then it's a great tool all right Rob, you, who you want to go to next here? Uh, I think we've got a question from Renee, um, just in regards to uh, a previous YouTube uh, video, Evan, um, where someone was asking about uh, leg spring stiffness uh, yep. and scores. So uh, they've got a few scores down there, um, but also asking for whether Stride provides guidance as to uh, what are good scores in, in each, of the, each of the metrics? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a great question. Um, like, like Jim showed on the, the Today's Plan platform there, I, when you look at leg spring stiffness, the value that gets reported in, in, in Stride is the kilonewtons per meter. And that's the amount of kilonewtons to compress your leg as a spring. So the, the, the units are, are there to reflect the, the you know, estimation there. When we look at actual comparison, we tend to divide by mass, like Jim said. And so uh, if I want to be able to track my, my own LSS over time, um, I definitely do look at LSS over kilograms. Um, if we're comparing different athletes, that's absolutely something as well. For a good score, I think that this is definitely um, a, a great question as well, because this is relevant for any metric that you find. Uh, good is a very, very, very broad term. Um, if somebody is able to run, let's just say from, from the running side, uh, you know, they can run a 5K in 1330 versus somebody that runs 1630, but the 1630 athlete has a quote unquote better leg spring stiffness. It doesn't necessarily mean they're a better runner. It just means that the metric is reflecting that. I think that for comparison purposes, uh, keeping as many variables the same as possible is absolutely key. So whether we're looking at form power, um, you know, I, we're looking at other metrics like ground contact time cadence. If they're all these metrics that play, um, you know, kind of the same part because running is again, it is that cyclical activity. It is a very, very dynamic movement. And so assigning like good or bad isn't something I ever like to do, but I absolutely um, do recognize uh, saying for, for LSS specifically, um, the kind of example that I believe is being referenced here is looking at, um, you know, just diving into the data uh, for this broad spectrum um, that we that we have for, you know, so many people that use Stride. We can say, you know, we identify that there's a bell curve, and we say people in, in the middle are around 0.141 um, LSS per kilogram, and then you know the the higher end is. Uh, you know, as you get above 0 0.145, 0 0.150, then if you're below 0 0.130, that definitely means that there's more people in the middle of that bell curve. So obviously, if you add in things like plyometrics, um, you add in things like hill sprints, um, work on that neuromuscular side, that might lead to improvements um, from that specific metric. So um, definitely addressing good and better for other metrics too. That's something that uh, we are definitely working on right now to integrate to the um, power center specifically and our mobile app specifically a little bit uh, better insights into specific values. But I think it's always important to remember um, that metrics should definitely be individualized, um, but there is good use in comparing things. You just have to um, keep in mind specifically what the variables that you're looking at actually um, interact with each other. So Jim, I don't know if you have any uh, other um, input on that specifically, if you're looking at uh, potentially different metrics like this for different athletes that you're coaching. Well, I think surface probably has, the surface that you tend to run on will, will play a big role. Um, and then of course the shoe, um, so yeah, you got to take that into consideration. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I know Canute, I, I literally was riding with him during, during tempo sessions and we're running along the coast of San Diego and there's like grass and, and the, the nice soft grass and then nice, uh, 
you know, a, a paved path and he's always, he wants the path. I'm like, why don't you want to run on there? He's like, because it screws up my numbers. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, if that's what you want to do. Like, I would be the guy to be running on the softer stuff. But uh, so you, you want to take that into consideration. There's, there's a lot to that. So uh, interestingly, and I think even, you know, probably uphill, downhill, you know, how much, you know, if you're, if you're doing a lot of uphill, downhill running, that's going to affect the average because part of this is contact time. So obviously in a downhill, you, you've got a longer stride. And so you're probably spending more contact time on the ground to brace and, and impact yourself. So uh, I assume I'm right there, Evan, am I? Yeah. And it's, um, it's such a dynamic thing too. So specifically LSS is one of those, um, you know, things that especially if somebody is coming uh, to, you know, to stride as a very beginner runner, it's, not something anybody hears about outside typically um, using stride, but it's one of those things that is definitely good to keep a track of, but it's so dynamic. So, um, you know, I would love to send out um, that link to uh, the activity I did too. So if people are really curious, um, I can definitely share that with Rob afterwards if uh, we're doing a newsletter or anything after this as a recap, um, but just to look at the differences and see how, you know, all the metrics play together over terrain, over different speeds. Cause at the, um, you know, at the end of that workout, I was running on a downhill with the wind at my back um, and I was feeling good. So I ran, uh, you know, 425 mile pace, right? And so I, I was feeling good at the end of a workout, um, but if I flipped it and ran up an uphill, um, the metrics might look totally different. So that that's something that's really interesting to uh, kind of um, play around with too. But like Jim said too, keeping it simple is, always a good thing as well for sure and just for reference uh in that in that run that i shared from edmonton for canute his average late spring stiffness per per kilogram body weight was 0 0.15 so right near those those numbers and that was a very uphill downhill course as you saw so uh yeah so interesting uh, okay i think we got another one here from an aiden rob we, we do indeed. Um, Aiden's asking, uh, how does the stride algorithms deal with the more variable running gait that occurs on trails due to obstacles and undulating surfaces? Yeah, I think this is a fascinating question. Um, I, I mentioned uh, that we have done a, a couple of webinars um, specifically on our YouTube channel. We had an Australian coach on uh, by the name of Andy Dubois, and he coaches trail athletes specifically um, with stride. So he coaches trail athletes with stride. Um, there is some very, very interesting stuff when it comes to trail races in terms of uh, looking at critical power um, and the validity of extending that to races that are anywhere from six to 12 to 24 plus hours, um, looking at different surfaces, like we were just talking about, whether you're running on dirt, whether all of a sudden you have to switch to sand, if you are changing shoes. Um, we have differences uh, in, in the algorithm to detect power hiking. So depending on the incline, depending on the cadence, depending on the motion there. Um, and we are definitely uh, looking into improving that with uh, research studies from our side, specifically on uh, usage on the trails. So that's that's definitely what I can say for for that stuff. Brilliant. So um, just to to throw back to uh, the the previous question, and uh, Jim, you you alluded to. Uh, needing to think about the, the shoes as well when, when you're considering uh, metrics. So um, just on the sort of what's been a flavor of a month uh, a, a little bit now, do, do shoes make a, a big difference to the, the readings on stride? So if you were looking at uh, racing flats versus the, uh, the hawkers in the, the long distance and obviously the Zoom vapor flies, which uh, everybody's talking about, um, do you see any differences between between those shoes? Um, from from my side, I, I can talk about it from the stride side. Unless you want to talk about what you've seen, Jim, specifically from your athletes first. Um, uh, honestly, I've I've not studied shoes much. Uh, I uh, I've just uh, I tell my athletes, hey, we're going to be consistent in the shoes that we wear, and then we're so that we know we have viable data, and then we 
you know, on race day, okay, there are there changes, but other than that, uh, we try to keep it consistent just to validate, uh, validate the data. Go ahead, Evan. Yeah, and, and from the stride side, uh, I guess I should say the thing I did uh, as a career before working at stride, I managed a running store for a couple of years. So um, I'm a shoe geek through and through. I love running shoes. I love racing shoes. Um, it seems like shoes are the thing that everybody wants to talk about um, now, just in, in terms of athletics and stuff, which is uh, fun for me because I get to see you know fun new, new stuff. In terms of uh, metrics being different, um, Absolutely, it is something that uh, we have seen. It's something that um, we would love to put a little bit more time into understanding specifically the differences. Um, I can comment, you know, one specific use case uh, is one, one of my coworkers was going to run a marathon. He typically runs an Adidas. He got a pair of the, you know, the Nike shoes, um, did some testing in them, found that for the, you know, for the same uh, power output on the same terrain, his LSS was a full point lower. So for him, he was normally, um, you know, 11.0 is his LSS number, but he was 10.0 down to like 9.5 in the 4%. So he actually performs worse biomechanically. Um, you know, it's something that uh, could potentially have somebody go in a motion capture lab and, you know, study all that stuff as well. Um, but for the stride data specifically, he saw that the LSS repeatedly, not just one session, repeatedly in, um, you know, the carbon plated shoes, uh, because he'd never worn anything like that before, his metrics were not good from that respect. Again, keeping all variables equal. Um, he decided to wear the 4%, did not have a great race, um, and then he has had good uh, responses to the Adidas stuff um, from 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 his side. Uh, so definitely, it is something we are absolutely more interested in. Um, one because I I love studying shoes and just looking at the differences, but because it is such a hot topic now about the performance differences and can you actually measure um, rather than uh, just look at the you know the studies that have been put out there. And the fun thing too, the original study that coined the uh, four percent name was done at the uh, CU Boulder, so uh, a little bit just down the road was the the naming convention for that that first shoe that kind of kicked off stuff. Um, yeah, for the shoe stuff, it's definitely something that uh, I, I think there's going to be a lot lot to come out in the future. Brilliant. Well, um, thank you very much to uh, the pair of you. I, I think that's been absolutely fascinating, and uh, as I say, I can't thank you enough for. Um, sparing your time, uh, especially late in the evening over in the United States. Uh, for us over, over here in Australia, really, really uh, appreciated. Um